everybody. So today we have a really special guest. This has been long overdue and a long time in the making, and I'm very, very excited, excited to have my dear friend Amrish together with us today. Amrish is a man that does not need any introduction, and no proper introduction will do justice to what he has accomplished so far in his journey. And I'm very excited to have him here with us to share his journey and the lessons that he learned along the way. So Amrish, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, it was just wonderful listening to your journey and how you've been connected to India. So thank you for all that you do. Uh, and I'm sure uh, what you present through these uh, you know, videos and podcasts of yours uh, help the Indian ecosystem. Thank you very much for that. Well, I definitely hope so. I definitely hope. But like I always say, it's not about affecting everybody. But if one person gets affected from it and changes their life, then we did our job. Absolutely. So, Arish, let's take a step back. You know, right now everyone knows you as the CEO of PayU. Let's take a step back to the a little guy, the little Arish. You know, where is he from and what was his upbringing like? So, you know, I'm a classic uh, Bombay boy, uh, the guy uh, who loves the city, absolutely uh, enjoyed uh, studying out there and, uh, you know, growing up in a city which had really multicultural, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, population. Uh, it was just a fantastic uh, learning experience. Um, on top of that, uh, my parents were typical uh, government employees, both used to work for public sector uh, uh, banks in India. So banking and financial services was something which I had uh, an immediate love for. Um, I, I, used to, I used to go to a, what I would call as a government school uh, in India. And uh, this, was, uh, this was in Bombay. Uh, and it was just perfect, right? There was no pressures in terms of uh, how you're doing on your education or what your scores are going to be. Uh, but one thing leading to another, I ended up doing my engineering. And that was just a fantastic base for me building my career on. Right. Let me ask you a side question. How realistic is Slumdog Millionaire being a Bombay <laughs> boy? <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 think, I think it happens every day, right? There's always a, a, a story out there in Bombay uh, about somebody uh, making it big, uh, starting off uh, in a very, uh, very moderate fashion. Uh, city is the city of dreams. Uh, I, I, I truly believe that this city, nobody goes to sleep hungry. Uh, this city provides for everybody who ever walks into the city. So uh, in, in the case of Bombay, uh, it's a place where dreams are fulfilled. Uh, I, I, I think Slumdog Millionaire happens every day in this city. Wow. He's saying everybody should move, so everyone should just move to Bombay. And, <laughs> and, and they are, right? So you're almost getting to be like, what, uh, 18, 19 million people. That's like population of Australia uh, into the city of Bombay. Um, yeah, people do move. <laughs> so, you know, let's jump to the main event. And, you know, obviously before we, you know, as we go along your story, you know, you have worked all your life until obviously you started your startup in the corporate world. And then, yeah. you know, one day, I'm not sure what the story is, we'll, we'll hear it from you. Um, you obviously probably got drunk with your co-founder and you decided, that, hey, let's create this crazy, we had this crazy idea, let's go ahead and start it. So tell us how the Citrus Pay come about. Sure, sure. So, you know, uh, first of all, uh, I loved my corporate life. I mean, I had, I had one of the most fantastic uh, journeys when it comes to uh, corporate careers. I had some amazing bosses. Uh, I, had, I, I met some really wonderful leaders who I worked with very early in my, uh, in my corporate life. And they sort of brought in uh, simple values, simple uh, ways of operating, uh, which was wonderful for me in the corporate journey. But, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, uh, you know, uh, I used to work for a great American company, um, you know, was living the dream uh, in India. Uh, but when I look back, I always felt that I missed a massive opportunity because that's when the whole software boom was happening. Uh, the time to do was build businesses out of India, in India, build large startups in India. And then we had a slightly slow period. And getting into 2010, 2011, that's when we went into the next phase, which was India from a consumption market had started to take off. Digital payments was taking off. I used to run uh, first data for Asia in those days. And I didn't want to make the same mistake again. Right? I, I absolutely wanted to grasp the opportunity what India provided. 
uh, and that's became and that's the time it became fairly clear that you had to do something in the digital payment space um and you know we don't have a drunk story but uh, very very uh, very very coincidences uh, uh, i met jitendra gupta actually um, through one of my business transactions in uh, first data um however the conversation when it came to starting of citrus it was during a vc party where you know we were just spending some time over a glass of wine he tells me he wants to go to incad i'm saying at the age of 28 who goes to incad are you crazy um, don't study at this age go to a startup uh, let's let's build something you know which could go uh, go a long way and that really uh, was the starting point for citrus uh, so it was so you know uh, later on i met the vc i did tell him the story that that's how it happened at a party that you had thrown he still insists that i should give him a bit of a cut out of the citrus exit that ain't happening that ain't happening <laughs> yeah i was about to ask that so obviously if you you know you have you had an entrepreneurial bug in you as most indians are risk averse they didn't have that you know let's go start a company i mean obviously you, you have it but the general consensus is not would you get the would you think you have the ability of entrepreneurship within you you know uh, risk taking i always think that uh, i should be a little bit more risk taking L- let me give you one story right i think entrepreneurship became really easy for me due to the fact that my wife actually worked there so my wife used to work we had double income coming in so at best what we had was half income coming in but that still paid for um, you know the school fees the place where we stayed so you know we were good but because you had that base in place we had your savings out there you had uh, an income which was still flowing through uh, the whole jump for entrepreneurship was lot lot easier uh, i wish i could tell you a story where you know i slept uh, or we slept uh, without having money in our pocket no that wasn't the case um, you know we had an income which was coming and we had something that we had saved over the years Right, and it's absolutely amazing. You know, thank God you did not have to go through that whole entire process. That's incredible. Yeah, thing. you know, that's another thing which I would, uh, you know, uh, tell every entrepreneur. Right, in the starting days, uh, I think what really worked for me was um, I had the oxygen to go through the tough times. Now, uh, and this was really, you know, ensuring the family is uh, very well settled. Uh, there was an income coming through. Uh, that. made it very easy for us how we think about our businesses and how we want to grow our startup uh, and i think that's a very important factor which every founder should keep in mind that if you have an opportunity to create the right environment by which you can go through the first 18 months of your startup journey um, i think that's how you should build your uh, startup let me take it a step further let me ask you like this you know you obviously were married when you started your startup and you had a child how important or how beneficial was it being in a relationship during the beginning days of your startup journey you know um, i think i think it was very important because uh, you know i had a, i had lots of travel to do all over the world uh, you know uh, two young kids uh, you know uh, both our kids uh, play a lot of sport uh, you know they play squash at a really competitive level and uh, and you know they had their own demands um on top of that you know my wife used to work in those days um so it it almost became really important that uh, there there needs to be somebody out there you know who's looking after the family and the complexities of what is going on in the rest of the world uh, so for me i think that was a really important part the other piece which you need to remember and i didn't say this was um i actually met my wife uh, uh, during college so she's a college sweetheart right so uh it was very easy to connect with her explain my thought explain my insecurities uh, i mean i i i have this i have this joke going on that says uh, anybody who is in his late 30s wants to do a startup is surely going through a midlife crisis so <laughs> so i think it was important to recognize that figure out what your support system is yeah it worked really really well wow so from this vc party You and Gupta, your co-founder, go ahead and you decided to launch Centris Pay. Right. What were some of the early struggles that you went through in the beginning? 
so i i think i think you know a lot of credit goes to uh, to jitain for what he did uh, in the really really early days right so uh, you know jitain as i told you it was a guy who had already quit his job was going to ncid i still was in the process of quitting my job and what i do next uh, so when we had the first office for citrus this was really out of a uh, a 200 square foot or 20 square meters uh, office Uh, which actually had machines running next door and you know two people couldn't hear each other while they were working uh, so it was a really frugal start that we had uh, but within 6 months i think that's when the network really helps right so we had a we had a really good network with uh, sequoia capital i'd been uh, uh, helping out sequoia with some of their payments related um, businesses and really working with some close friends in sequoia and uh, sequoia was really ready to back uh, citrus early so while we went through a really frugal start and you know uh, went through the tough times in a in a 20 square meter uh, room uh, sequoia came in very early i got a very funny story to tell about sequoia so we actually had um, a term sheet which was uh, uh, you know somewhere in the region of a million dollars and um, and 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 you know the investor was asking for somewhere in the region of 24% for that million dollar investment um i called up sequoia and i said oh sequoia you know i've got a term sheet at 1.1 million dollars uh, i just bumped it up by 100000 while i shop it around uh and uh, you know the sequoia md actually told me saying hey you know what give me um, 24 hours i'll come back to you i fully expected a 1.1 million dollars for the 24% to come along as the offer and he actually ended up offering close to 2 million dollars wow. for exact same amount of uh, equity um and i think that's just the kind of vc that we were introduced to and we had on our cap table worked very good for us in the early part of the citrus journey oh, wow so that tell me when you're going through those dark times right now obviously everything has a dark time you never knew if this is going to work day you could have woke up and the whole thing could have collapsed yeah yeah what were you telling yourself during those times a message to keep yourself alive and hope and to keep on going what was that belief that you had that kept you going so you know um, our dark times were really trying to figure out where is payments going to go in india so you know on one side we had china which was completely Uh, a consumer payments driven market while on the other hand there was the us which was uh, a largely a visa master network led uh, businesses and india was still evolving and where it was ready to go uh, so we had a situation where we had a great start uh, however we had competition coming from everywhere we really did not know what we needed to do as the next step and we didn't really needed to figure out where should money go what should you invest into uh, so in a way i think the place or the point where we could have almost uh, gone wrong were the best days for digital payments in india uh, and where we could have gone wrong is we would have taken a completely different path and we tried it right we tried going down the wallet path we tried going down an app path uh, for payments and uh, you know we were very lucky to realize that um you know those businesses are not working those businesses are not going through i guess what what is really important in those days is um trying to remain loyal to what you know best and what you think you can make a real impact on uh you know it's no use looking into somebody else's plate trying to figure out what's the person eating in his plate you really need to figure out what you've got on your hands what are your key strengths and just keep focusing on it and that's when we realized that um payments uh, is what we do really well that's what our core capabilities are and we literally double down in that space uh, we had to let go businesses so you know we let go of the app uh, which wasn't moving too well uh, we cut down on our wallet completely and allowed us to put all the fuel behind the payments business uh, and i think that was a fantastic bet that we took wow. that is such an important lesson um sticking with your conviction in the sense if you look at life as two big circles and right. one circle knowing what you know your competence circle of competence and the other right. circle the general knowledge but sticking with your circle of competence right. and then everything else just what you know is not stuff that you don't know about right. just sticking with you know it's just such an important lesson it's incredible and and especially in the emerging markets right so when you look at the emerging markets and you know there's this 
a massive excitement around uh, a China, uh, Africa, and Israel, and India, uh, Brazil. Everybody wants to invest into it. So when you look from a founder's point of view, the founder is actually saying that, hey, you know, I'm living the Goldilocks years. Um, anything which I do in this market is going to become successful. Not true. Uh, like you said at the start of this one is, uh, uh, you know, you still have 90% of startups failing in these emerging markets. And I think a lot of them fail because, uh, you know, people try and aspire to do things where they don't have competencies in. So you really need to be very careful with it. Now, at the, at the same time, you also need to be excited about an opportunity area. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of people even today believe that cash is the way uh, India is going to operate. And if you would just sit behind and say that, well, you know what, digital payments are not going to take off. We believe cash is what's going to become successful in India. You would have never started the company. So you've got to take risks, but take risks on the backs of something that uh, you have solid within you or within your founding team. Right. 100%. That's great. So tell me like this from corporate life. And you, know, you obviously were, you could have been a manager and you had people working under you. But being an entrepreneur and a CEO is a whole new different ballgame. Right. So what were the skills that you had to learn as a company grew to employee-wise and, every, and everything as it grew in general? What were the skills that you personally had to learn and pick up? So, you know, there are two parts to the uh, two, two parts to the answer, right? The first part out of it is uh, just how you conduct yourself and how you conduct your businesses. So even in the corporate life, uh, I had a fantastic journey with First Data where uh, I ran First Data for nine years, uh, built a billion dollar business uh, here in India for First Data. And again, there I was employing number one for First Data. First Data was going through basic management turmoil all over the world. Literally no manager ever turned up in force data for four years period um, and being employee number one and taking that business to 1700 was really like building a startup right and taking it to a billion dollar uh, business uh, was really exciting uh, what i really enjoyed in that was uh, i was able to operate in what i do best i take a lot of uh, game theory to my uh, style of operations and when i say game theory i mean game theory uh, so which is Think of everybody being on a sports field. Think of everybody, you know, wanting to, uh, you know, put the put the passes through, put the balls through, uh, you know, make somebody successful so that the team wins. Um, I, I think those are core principles on which I operated and that worked really well for me uh, in the startup world. I guess the second part which I had to really learn was in the corporate world, uh, everybody has a motivation of what is called as promotion everybody is wanting to go one level higher. In the startup world, everybody wants to do a fantastic job. Everybody wants to be close to the founder. Everybody wants to be close to a mission, which is a completely different motivation to somebody who's wanting to go up the ladder. So when you have these, um, you know, this kind of a team, which has a completely different motivation to uh, the corporate world, you need to almost handle it differently. Uh, so the so the usual piece of these are my HR policies, uh, you know, um, I, I'm sure you guys are struggling, you're going to struggle with each other, trying to go one level higher, and hence everybody will perform better, does not work in the startup world. Uh, you almost need to have different levers, you need to connect with everybody in the team, uh, you know, virtually I would say, 90% of your team, you should know them by your first names, you know. And if you don't know them, that means you built a team which is just too big. Uh, you've got to figure out <laughs> how do you reduce your team. Uh, but I think it's a lot about personal connect. Um, and that's something which I found really enjoyable uh, in the startup world. Wow. So then what are some practical lessons that someone could implement in their startup to build that phenomenal culture of, you know, a real collaboration of working towards the same mission and everything? Yeah, I think, um, uh, and and I don't say this because you know you've got to create it. I think it's uh, it's something much more basic. Uh, it's very important for everybody to see where we are headed, and where does this fit in in the history of um, of the city or the country that you are operating in. Uh, everybody should understand why these three years or four years that they spend in the startup are going to be the best for them in their career. And while they're going through that journey, uh, you as a founder should be able to communicate that to them, um, really let them understand that this is a really special time that they are in. 
and you could do it based on different things right you could do it you know somebody would really sell the dream saying uh, we built a unicorn building a unicorn happens only a uh, hundred times ha- or has happened only hundred times in the last five years uh, we all are going to become a part of becoming a unicorn others in my case was you know, cash was really going to digital uh, this was a really massive movement for india where infrastructure around digital payments uh, is being built uh, and and really what i felt as being a part of this journey was this is a mission to take india to a different uh, position uh, and and that's what i tell everybody around me which says that for the next 10 years what we will do in digital payments will be remembered for the next 50 years uh, 100 years uh, people are going to look at times between 2010 and 2025 and think that these were the golden years or this is when change happened in india when it comes to digital payments and you know what we were part of it um, i think that's really important to set the context for the team i, I things like you know you did a raise uh, you raised from a big vc i think nobody cares about that nobody is interested with all of those things i think people are always looking for that one level higher mission in their life right that's that's absolutely incredible and having that one mission which is you know brings out like the intrinsic value of an individual person not looking for that you know the external thing to grab onto materialistic thing it's more of an internal pleasure that you have that's what it is so you have a crazy story from my understanding with um masayashi son um the who whoever i'm sure everyone knows who he is if not he is the founder of softbank yeah what is the story so this is a, a crazy story and i actually couldn't be there for that meeting but jitain was there and a partner of mine was there for that meeting and this was in japan and um, and we were just sort of completing our uh, our series b with what another year? sorry what year is this uh, so this was in 2013 2014 okay. to end of 2013 2014 and uh, we were just signing our series b and one of our friends in sequoia actually a singaporean guy uh, lives here in singapore he got us in front of this guy sonsan uh, and honestly those were the innocent days right you really didn't know who is sonsan you have no clue right anyhow we said well you know must be a wealthy japanese guy let's go meet the guy um and not knowing what was happening we actually signed our series b in the morning uh, with another japanese company and in the afternoon we had this meeting with sonsan uh, and this meeting went on for about an hour uh, at the end of that meeting uh, sonsan asked us saying i want 40% of your company and our response on that was well we just signed a series b uh, we don't know how to play this cap table we are too young for all of this uh, we're going to think and come back to you lesson number 1 never tell sonsan that we going to think and come back to you <laughs> but we actually told him you know we going to think about it we going to come back and, and you know uh, as things would have it we actually went back to them and said um we don't know how to do this because you know we've just signed with the uh, series b with somebody else uh, we don't know how our cap table could be turned to get you in uh but i'm sorry you know we don't we don't think so we can have a conversation at this time Uh, let's keep in touch uh, we'll come back to you in the few months time well it never happened but look i think we were honest to ourselves at least so when he told him like did he ever ask you the son ever ask you like do you know who i am yes we did have that sort of a conversation and the guys around him actually did sort of you know nudge nudge saying you sure you know who sonsan is right and uh, look you got to th- you got to put this into context right just in the morning you signed the series b all which we were thinking about it was uh, when are we all just going to get together and have a nice blast and there's another meeting in between so we were just sort of not in the frame but uh, again i think those were the innocent days uh, I-, i think those were good days where you know people uh, people were not so much enamored with you know what's the money which is sloshing around mm-hmm. um, you know how do you look at a vc and how does a vc influence your thinking or an investor influence your thinking i'm sure we would have reacted to it completely differently today yeah. Uh, yeah. but in those days i thought we made a fair decision wow so as long as you're happy and able to sleep at night with your decision that's good yeah absolutely absolutely yeah always so tell us like this so obviously you know thank god everything worked out with the other japanese venture um you know unfortunately didn't get softbank 
but things worked out for Citrus along the way. And it comes this moment when someone, a company offers you to buy you out. Tell me about that emotional feeling. You know, you've been building it for four years and all of a sudden someone says, hey, you know what? We want to buy out Citrus. Yeah. What were you going through? So an extremely tough decision because, you know, we were just not ready for this conversation. You know, we were not mentally there to have a discussion about selling Citrus. Um, what we, and you know, the, the pay you guys, the, the guys who were interacting with us, absolute gentlemen, you know, really, really respectful. We were competing with them every day in the market. And, um, you know, competing with them every day in the market meant that, um, you know, we had to give them the data, but not give them the data. And uh, it was a little bit complex in terms of how we had wanted to manage the conversation with them. Um, but one thing leading to another, as we provided them with more material and more information, um, they were ready to, uh, you know, take this discussion to another level altogether. Uh, and that's the time when we had to really struggle to figure out that, uh, do we believe that partnering with PayU would create a bigger payments organization for us or would we go on our own and create a much larger organization? Uh, and we felt that partnering with PayU would create a much bigger organization. Then comes the ne next question which says, uh, do we completely sell and just walk away or do we sell and then build this for a certain period of time? And I think those are some very important decisions because, you know, again, goes back to my earlier story, right? You build a dream for the employees. You build a dream for the team. You have your own dreams. And just because you sold the company, you shouldn't sell your dreams, right? Um, your dreams are very, very important for you. Uh, and what your employees have there as their dreams are very important for you. So when you sell your company, I would always say that, uh, you owe it to the employees, you owe it to the new incoming shareholder that you make this business a success. So when you see where PayU has gone over the last two, two and a half years time, you just feel proud of what has been achieved by uh, uh, by the organization, the, the PayU team and the Citrus team. Um, and, and it's just a fantastic, fantastic experience. Uh, the other piece, which is an important baggage that we sometimes carry in India is there haven't been too many transactions of large value where a foreign institution has come in and has ended up with a very successful acquisition. I think we owe it back to the ecosystem. I think Indian founders owe it back to their other founders that they make acquisitions work. So incoming shareholders feel really comfortable with the Indian business and Indian entrepreneur. Uh, it's a very important part of every founder's journey, I think. Right. 100%. And I'm going to ask this question, like, you know, you being obviously one of the, the, the people that have sold a company for a really phenomenal amount. Um, you know, when you sold your company, it was the big largest financial transaction for a financial company at that period of time. Where do you see, and you, you've stayed currently involved in the startup ecosystem through angel investing or providing money to VCs and everything. Where do you think the Indian startup ecosystem is currently holding and where do you think it's going to go? So I think we are in, uh, in phase two of the Indian uh, startup um, uh, journey. Uh, we are in the stage two of entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a pre-2015 and there is a, a post-2017. I think 2015 to 2017 was, um, was really tough days uh, for Indian entrepreneurship. And Pre-2015, uh, while we had some fantastic businesses which got incubated and got created like an Ola, a Snapdeal, a, 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 a free charge, a Flipkart, um, I think these were still businesses which had a similar model somewhere around the world. But what we're getting to see now, starting with 2017 and onwards, some amazing entrepreneurs coming along and they are completely focusing on areas around uh, uh, local language. How do you address a market of a billion? How do you address sectors which don't come under classic uh, uh, startup uh, entrepreneurship world? So, for example, farming. How do you uh, get into you know healthcare? How do you get into uh, infrastructure building as a startup? And they're doing some amazing work, bringing technology to uh, old school businesses and completely um, you know disrupting the operating model. 
I'm, I'm feeling it very, very bullish about Indian entrepreneurs and Indian startup world. And if you look at what's happened in the last six, nine months time, great businesses have been getting great funding. Uh, so now the Series B is looking at 30 million plus or $50 million is what your Series B is looking because people are building businesses which are really solving for India and solving for problems of India. Uh, I think entrepreneurship is at its peak right now in India, if you ask me. But it is it is the phase two uh, of Indian entrepreneurship. Right. 100%. And then, you know, we're going to look forward to see what phase three brings also. You know, all yes. the other motivations. It's incredible. So. Who are some of the people that have made a difference in your life, the people you look up to, your mentors? So, you know, as I said, some of my uh, early managers, um, you know, have made a fantastic uh, contribution to, uh, to my journey. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, there was this Malaysian guy who had come down to India uh, to spend uh, literally two years and he really taught me the art of selling and he taught me something which was very important which is uh, walk the street if you're ever in a if you're ever in trouble if your mind is clouded just walk the street go meet your customer and you'll get your answers um, he just inculcated some simple things into me and that has worked really well uh, moving onwards there was uh, you know loni who uh, loni anthony who the one of the founders of uh, prism payments he made a very big impact and he taught me how to uh, how to deal with people, handle uh, employees. And again, I think a lot of my operating principles really come out of him was he purely believed in the fact that if you have a team which is happy, uh, a team which trusts each other, you, know, you can achieve anything. So uh, came very early to me, having worked with Loni, that, uh, uh, that you're only as good as what your team is. So team became something really important. Um, Along the way, uh, Jitain has uh, has also uh, you know been a big impact uh, on my uh, on my journey. Uh, he just taught me the importance of you know uh, being diligent, being meticulous, being uh, focused on the on the today, and uh, you know that that ensured that whenever we had an important answer of important question to respond to, uh, we had to look at it from many different angles before we go forward. Uh, so I think that was uh, another really impactful uh, thing for me, if you ask me. Wow. I would love to know what is your foundation? What is your principles, the values that you truly believe in? You know, um, <clears throat> again, that's where I say my corporate journey was a, was a great time, right? I think a lot of my principles actually come out of my corporate journey and uh, the experiences I learned there. And, you know, things are not all that ugly in the corporate, right? It's not all that ugly. Uh, I learned some few basic things, right? Which is that, uh, you know, it's always team first. Um, keep your ethics and integrity at the highest level. Uh, uh, again, that's a really important part. Third, don't do things which uh, which you're going to wonder about when you're about to go to sleep. Um, be absolutely above board on things. And then finally is the fact that, you know, uh, company first, you second. Um, if you If you follow those principles, uh, I think you would be headed in the right direction. 100%. Ah, one, more, one more thing, one last thing. Uh, don't take yourself seriously. So, uh, uh, you know, I must say I'm a little bit embarrassed to do what I'm doing just now. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't take myself quite seriously. I love my game of cricket. I play with 18-year-olds and I play with, you know, guys uh, who are jobless at this time. And I absolutely love my time in the park. Uh, just because you know it's a it's a fantastic uh, thing to get to know people and just don't think take things too seriously. Right, one hundred percent. And you, you know, you seem like you are. I know a very fun guy to hang around. You know, you're the party man. You know, so, so tell me what message, like you know, let's say you had this guy, new young entrepreneur from India, from anywhere else. You know, gets a hold of you and he's like, hey, I'm rich. You know, I'm either starting my startup or I'm debating to start a startup or I'm middle of starting a startup. What advice what do you give them what are the, the core message you would tell them to do so you know different people different things right just you got to understand who you're talking to you know you'll always meet that entrepreneur uh, you know who's, who's such a passionate guy that he wants to just keep pushing at start, startups and at entrepreneurship for 10 years of a life not noticing that he's actually burnt himself uh, at the same time you'll always meet somebody you know who's who's just right from entrepreneurship, 
uh, but does not believe in himself, right? Now, those are the guys that you want to really spend time with and try and let them know saying that, look, you have it in you. The ecosystem is right. All that you need to do is just take the plunge and go forward with it. Um, and, and, and really giving them the confidence that entrepreneurship is, is something which is very, very exciting and can be, uh, you know, a, a process through which you yourself go through and grow through. Uh, I, I think that's a really important part. The second piece, which is um, which is slightly different from what others would say, is that I actually think that the VC world, at least in India, is really good. Uh, I think the VCs are kind. They understand that Indian entrepreneurs are new. Um, so I would say that embrace the VC world very early. Make friends. Take advice. Um, uh, you know, do what you want to do. But you know, make friends, take advice, and uh, you know, the ecosystem is just ripe. You know, to create a massive uh, startup in the country. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. So, what are the outside passions you have besides cricket and um, you know business? I'm a Scotch father. I'm a I'm an absolute Scotch father. Uh, I I travel all over the world uh, with my uh, with my kids, watching them play. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, in the in the game of Scotch, the ball hits the wall. But I've seen millions of balls hit the wall there. Uh, I just love the fact that, you know, uh, I get to connect with my kids uh, over a game of squash, uh, see them evolve, see them grow, see them uh, accept failures, accept wins. Uh, it's just a fantastic uh, experience. Uh, I just can't see myself, you know, sitting with my son in the study uh, and try and give him uh, a talk about what life is all about. I would love to have that conversation with my daughter or my son. Uh, just outside of Scotch Court. So I just love my time following them. It's been a beautiful part of my life, actually. And there's so many lessons to learn from there. You know, it's like starting a startup. You know, you go through the stage that you're totally terrible and you get better over time. And then you overcome so many failures and hardships and it's constantly growing. You know, you, you win and you lose and you, you learn from the lessons of loss. So it's so, so similar. Absolutely. The other piece which I've been thinking about over the last uh, 12 months is that we've had entrepreneurs in India who have actually exited and, um, you know, life has been kind with us. Uh, I think it's very important for us to start a movement in India where uh, the fortunate founders you know, need to give back to the society, uh, really need to give back to uh, uh, growing India and for the lesser privileged uh, people. Uh, I'm, I'm very keen to do something in that space uh, over the next over the next few years, if you ask me. Wow, that's incredible. Really inspirational, inspiring, also too. So what message do we tell a younger Amrish, before, you know, is coming out of university, facing the real world for the first time? What do we tell them? Again, you know, I'm not good at all of these things, right? I'm just not good at all. I, I really don't take myself too seriously. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't give an advice to anybody else and actually tell him saying, let me tell you my experience tells you that. Uh, I would always end it up with says, that's what I think, you know, take it or throw it. So uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell this to even my own self at the age of 20. Like, dude, do your own thing, figure it out. You'll fail a bit. Who cares? That's fine. I love it. I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's true. Because at the end of the day, everyone has their own journey. And the only way, one way to figure it out is to just, like Nike says, just do it. Yeah, and just, do it. just do it. Just go ahead, run at it full force. And yeah, you get knocked down, but get back up and do it again. Do it again. Yeah. That's how it works. Yeah, exactly. Amrish, this has been absolutely amazing. You know, this has been so much fun. Um, very inspiring too. And I personally have learned a tremendous amount, not just ha what happened to Citrus and how it came about, but from your entrepreneurship journey and from your yourself. And I love the fact, you know, basically don't take yourself, don't take life so seriously. You know, we live once only. And, you know, like you say, gamify life. Just have a great time. Obviously have a responsible time, but have a great time. I mean, I'm responsible, so it's, too, it's also great sometimes. But <laughs> have a great time. 
And I have learned a tremendous amount. That's what you're doing. Like what you're doing. I, you know, I'm really, really inspired to hear what you're doing. Uh, you know, a new country, a new business, uh, you know, completely new ecosystem. Um, you know, you've dropped me emails three times to get this call going. Uh, I've been traveling over. But you've been relaxed to follow up with it. You haven't come back and say, you know, what a prick. I'm not going to follow up with him anymore. Uh, really, really appreciate uh, what you're doing. Uh, you must be on a fun journey. Yeah, it definitely is incredible. And being the, the, have, me having the opportunity to, spe- to connect with wonderful and amazing people like you is what keeps it going and keeps the, the flame alive. And this flame, God willing, gets touched, gets touched, and it's about affecting the next person, you know, and lighting his flame, which will affect the next flame. Next yeah. So, Amrish. Thank you so much, buddy. This has been absolutely incredible. Appreciate your time. Appreciate what you do. Thank you.